Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And aloha. My name is Mark Schwab, and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we will go across the sea to the FSM. You may ask, what does SF FSM stand for? Well, that's the title of our program. What is the FSM? Where did it come from? What type of legal systems does it have? And today my guest is Edward King. Mr. King was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the FSM. We will discuss the creation and composition of the FSM, Mr. King's road to becoming the Chief Justice of the FSM, and the FSM's legal system, and what Mr. King's role was in its development. Aloha, Mr. King. Chief Justice King, aloha. Yeah. <clears throat> Welcome. Aloha to you, Mark. And uh, may, may I call you Ed? You could call me Ed. <laughs> I would be much more comfortable with that. At this. Right. Well, I, you, you, you tipped me off earlier that I could do that, so I appreciate uh, yep. the courtesy. Uh, Ed. What does FSM stand for? FSM stands for the Federated States of Micronesia. And to understand how it came into being, uh, because it included within it several different cultural and language groups, uh, you have to understand a little farther back, and that is the uh, trust territory of the islands of the Pacific. Uh, and that was created uh, in an agreement between the United States and the United Nations at the end of World War II. And uh, the United States took one of the 11 trusteeships that were created by the United Nations at that time so that uh, metropolitan nations could oversee the uh, economic and political development of the areas they were that were placed under their trusteeship responsibility and uh, at that point it included Palau and the Marshall Islands and the Northern Mariana Islands which is now a, a separate commonwealth of the United States and that area was a tremendous area in the ocean as big as the United States uh, continental United right. States at least and uh, and from that, uh, in the 70s, a strong movement began, the early 70s, toward other, other of these trusteeships had been disbanded up in the 60s. And so far, at that time, there had been no movement by the United States. But uh, now, you know, in the next few years, and as early as 1977, uh, the uh, Constitution had been developed by the Federated States of Micronesia, and even uh, operation of government, kind of partial, uh, partial sovereignty had developed. Uh, like, for example, the Federated States of Micronesia, at the time that I became part of it, had a, an executive branch and a legislative branch and, and the existence of various states within it, but it had no judicial system the, that was created for it. The trust territory of the Pacific Islands High Court was still uh, carrying out the uh, court work. And, and, and that was, that high court was part of what? Uh, or, who, who was in charge of that? The High Court was uh, part of what the United States had created, created under the trusteeship arrangement, and uh, it, w it consisted of judges appointed by the Secretary of the Interior and unfortunately serving at the Secretary's pleasure. So these judges were, they, they were actually a little more like administrative people. They had no judicial independence in any day. The Secretary of the Interior, offended with a uh, particular decision, could uh, send that person back home. And uh, 
so they were they were still in charge. But these people were always appointed by the Secretary of the Interior, and they were always subject to displacements by the Secretary of the Interior. So it it really reduced uh, anything approaching uh, judicial independence for that court. Okay, so that, that was post-World War II situation. Right. And the United Nations decided that these islands, which I guess they're, they're, they're the islands are, are close to the Philippines and... The islands, the islands are an area, well, if we're talking about the trust territory, I've kind of talked about where that is, but I didn't say where uh, where it was in relation to other places. And you're right, it's between, it's it's to the west of Hawaii and, uh, and primarily a little south of Hawaii. And uh, then the Philippines are down at the other end there, the next beginning of the rest of the world. And then <laughs> since then, Palau, which is the westernmost, has, has developed its own republic, the Republic of Palau. The Marshall Islands, which is the easternmost area, uh, has become the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And that left, and the, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana now has be, opted to become part or within the jurisprudence and jurisdiction of the United States. And that left uh, Kushai, Pohnpei, Chuk, and Yap areas uh, staying with the Federated States of Micronesia. Okay, so the, and those four um, areas are like independent states? So is that what they are or they're, part of the Federation? They're what, very, what is the relationship they're very with those? comparable to states in the United States. They have, they have a broad range of powers, but there is a federal government that does certain things, and they have a constitution very similar to that of the United States, indeed based upon, modeled upon the United States Constitution, in part because I think people felt they were, they had, they could compare uh, life under the Germans and under the Japanese and under the Spanish even before mm -hmm. that, and they thought the United States was, was, uh, Although some people would say, no, that wasn't the case, and that even the Japanese, who were pretty darn tough at that time, uh, some people say, well, that was better because there was more order, and et cetera. But uh, I think most of the people thought a relationship with the United States would be pretty good. And so, and so that was maybe the model, is what you're saying, of the Constitution. That's that right. ultimately developed. And, and, and who was behind that? You said that this happened in the... the 60s to 70s, is that yeah. the period of time? Who was behind it? And there were some really admirable leaders at that point. One of the things that made Micronesia attractive to me at that time, and I was living in the, in the uh, well, I was living in Saipan from 1972 mm. to toward the end of 1976 as a legal services attorney. Uh, and I came to know who some of those key figures were throughout Micronesia because I was chief of uh, litigation there for the legal services program and we did a lot of big deal things during that time and I got to know the areas well and the people within them. We always represented Micronesians and quite often it was vis-a-vis -vis the trust territory government. So it was wonderfully exciting legal work uh, and uh, also really good and it gave me a good chance. And my wife was a, my wife was also editor or she was working with Pacific Daily News and she was the Micronesia, wow. the head Sydney of the Micronesian Bureau such as it was. She was in fact the Micronesian Bureau. But she also traveled throughout Micronesia. So we both got a good background in Micronesia and got to know a lot of Micronesian people. So, so po post-war there was this kind of trusteeship of these islands, uh, then four of them, these island states got together, sounds like, and, and there was an internal push for some sort of independence, but modeled after the United States Constitution yeah, in a way. with a, a strong wish to be independent and govern themselves too. And that was internal. But, I, but right. I should add one other thing to be able to understand how they got together because they were a long way apart right. even though they were under the same uh, umbrella. A, a lot of sea in between. You bet. And uh, 
the trust territory government uh, allowed to be formed, or you could perhaps say did form, a Congress of Micronesia. And uh, the, the, a lot of key leaders emerged in that institution, and they became a voice vis-a-vis -vis the trust territory, which, you know, inevitably, even having, if, if it had done the greatest job, which it did not, but if it had, it would uh, still have been unpopular because it was an outside governing vehicle. Uh, but the leaders, some of the leaders that uh, emerged were uh, Toso Nakayama, who became the first president, uh, and Don Amarij, who uh, was, though they are both from Chuk, Andon was the uh, head of the, uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee when I got to know him, and he also served as a board member of Legal Services, and so I got to know him through that context. Uh, and then uh, Petrus Toon, who became the vice president, he was from Yap, and John Mangafell, who uh, was served ultimately as, at, as the governor of Yap for a number of years, and Bethwell Henry would be the people that I considered really the, the most important leaders. And, and these four states uh, were separated by vast oceans, and they, did they have other things that separated them or made them in common? or? Or well, why did they choose to come they, together? They had, they, they chose, in part, they chose to come together. They chose by a, a large uh, majority, uh, but in part they did that as a practical matter yeah. because they didn't have really any, any particular alternative. They really didn't want to do what the Commonwealth of Northern Marianas did to actually just kind of opt out of Micronesia. They, I think, if anything, there was a little more of a sense uh, that that the, the islands that comprise Micronesia uh, are a little more committed to the idea of Micronesia. Yeah. You know, there's some question about whether there is such a place as Micronesia, <laughs> and it was a name that was convenient to yeah. kind of pick up everybody in a particular area of the world. But it's uh, every they didn't in, people didn't use to call themselves Micronations. Right. They were always Pons or Chukis or did, whatever. Do they still do that? Is, is, is they they still, still refer to Micronesia. Micronesia. Or, or do they still refer to themselves by their island state? Or? Oh yeah, it's just well, of course, a lot of people in the U.S. still of think course. of themselves I'm Hawaiian. particularly. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I mean, uh, you know, what are you? Where are you from? Oh, Hawaii. I live in Hawaii, and uh, and the same Indiana. I was I grew up in, and I was very strongly <laughs> Indiana, but I was also very strongly United States, and and. And I always thought the United States ran well. And so it sounds like these folks felt there was a, a, a benefit to being a community to, together right. in, in, a, in a federation, although they still retained some of their feelings about them, their own island state. Exactly. And, and, but they said, you know, for everybody, it's good to join together, be part of this one group, this one federation. That's right, but also to understand the nuance involved in that, you, there was also a constitutional convention formed. And that constitutional convention, uh, convention was attended by people from all parts of the trust territory. The Northern Marianas, Palau, the Marshalls, and then also Kushai, Yap, Onpe, Chuk, within what's now the Federated States of Micronesia. And they formed this vehicle, the Constitution. And it was a very carefully thought out vehicle. Uh, Norm Miller from Hawaii was, was there. And he was, uh, he was a, a really very well-known polit political science professor at UH and was a wonderful person. And, uh, and he was uh, the head of the of the, the administrative head and kind of the legal work head of the Constitutional Convention. Okay, I want to take a break right now. Okay. And then we'll talk about post-convention and what happened and the legal system and how you became Chief Justice. And, right. and what 
issues you, you found in that job. All right? All right. All right there's thanks. a lot there. <laughs>
uh, that there were, they were setting up a new program there, which flabbergasted me. I couldn't imagine how the U.S. system could work in Micronesia. <laughs> I called Joan and I said, hey, would you like to go to Micronesia? And she said, no. And I said, no, do you know where it is? And she said, no, and that's one of the reasons. <laughs> and, and But ultimately, she was persuaded that it, that it actually was a good thing to do. And I went not to help create the program, but later after it had been created, mm -hmm. the person that was in charge of litigation left. The deputy, he was deputy director, and he left there. And I interviewed for the job, and that was by itself an interesting story, but I won't go there now. And uh, so I then became the director of litigation at Micronesian Legal Services Corporation. And as I said, it got us all over Micronesia and exposed us to big issues like challenging the U.S. about explosives testing, and then we talk. And we uh, persuaded them that they needed to stop that before the court issued a junk, an injunction, but it was clear that the court would have done that. Sam King here in Hawaii as the federal judge, a wonderful I, man. Yes, he is, a good friend of mine. Uh, at some point... But you need to use past tense. Uh, yes, he was yes. a good friend, a very good friend, and yes. I know his kids very well. Too. Yes, he was wonderful. Uh, uh, good guy. We uh, did a program on, on, oh, his, on his life good here for you. with his daughter. Good for you. Um, so after the Constitution, they needed a chief justice. All right. And uh, what did, how did that? So well, somebody, it was very interesting. You got to call on the phone. We left. <laughs> it, really, it was like that. We left in uh, September of 1976. We came back, and I started uh, running the United or the National Senior Citizens Law Center. And uh, one day, uh, somebody called my office. And our person who answered the phone came back, she told me there's somebody here from Micronesia and he would like to see you. And, uh, and so we set up a time that the person was somebody I knew, but not really well. I didn't know these leaders really well, but they knew who I was and I knew who they were. Right. And uh, so this was Petrus Toon from Yap, but uh, also the first vice president of the Federated States of Micronesia, and also another wonderful person. And he came and told me that the president, Toswo Nakayama, had uh, sent him because he wanted to have, have him ask me if I would be the first chief justice. And uh, that came out of the blue. Came totally out of the blue. And I went home and told my family. And we sat, Sunday morning, we sat down and we had breakfast together and we talked about this and somewhere in the course of the meal each one of us jointly and severally in some time cried because it was such a powerful thing both oh, yeah. ways the kids really were reluctant to have and we all knew we would basically break up our nuclear family yeah. Uh, we, one of our daughters was uh, in, high, in college at Boston University, but the others were both high school or grade school. And uh, they would no longer grow up in our household because uh, You'd move. we knew that it wouldn't just be a workable Better situation. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it took, then took another several months and it happened that I had a trip through Micronesia and I met all these legal service attorneys and they all knew kind of thought I'd already been uh, appointed, and they all really worked on me to do it, and so I wound up telling the president I would. Okay, so you became the Chief Justice of the Federated States of Micronesia. What, right. what, were, your, what were your major concerns, and what, what happened, and what was perhaps, uh, you know, some of your critical, critical decisions during that period, when you, right. after you became Chief Justice. Well, just very quickly, when I when I arrived in March of '82, uh, for this purpose, uh, I met Judge Benson, Richard Benson, who had been a judge in Guam for quite some time and was University of Michigan Law School graduate, 
and uh, he, had, he had arrived the day before I did because he knew I was coming in at that time. And so he worked with me throughout all of this, although I probably won't pay him proper uh, tribute as I go along. Uh, and uh, then we didn't have an office, we didn't have a court, we had, we had our own houses in the first year. My wife didn't come the first year because she was trying to get the kids situated, so I was there a year and six, four months. And I had court, and we weren't ready to hear cases either. We had to, this had, the United States had set out another thing called Secretarial Order 80, 8093. And, uh, and it recalled up for us to get our court certified by the Chief Justice of the Trust Territory High Court. But we needed to do something like that anyway to get started. So we were having to form court rules, et cetera, all the things you need to do and identify positions we needed filled and start looking for those positions and get them filled. So in the, 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 the couple minutes we have left, okay. tell me, you know, how did you deal with the conflicts or controversies getting in, into customs and traditions of, of the people and, and the new constitution? We were given jurisdiction for all cases where somebody could be sentenced for, th criminal cases where somebody could be sentenced for three or more years. And that put us into lots of places where there are conflicts. One of the biggest conflict was uh, when there was e either punishment or forgiveness under customary or traditional law, but the prosecutor of the state who was handling the prosecution wanted to go on and continue the case in the case of a, uh, of a forgiveness uh, and say, no, we don't recognize that forgiveness. The court should have a separate trial. And uh, so that was a problem. And we ultimately decided in that that, that a lot of things had changed since that practice had been developed and that uh, we wanted to encourage the practice because it did a thing the Western system doesn't even do. It brings the parties together and they, they forgive and they talk to each other and they sit and they drink sakao, a sacred drink in, in Pohnpei in this case, but some other kind of uh, resolution and, and gifts back and forth and so on in the other areas. And that, that definitely we wanted to uphold, but we wanted to monitor in a way, and then we gave benefit for that in the sentencing. Uh, we acknowledged that and took into consideration the fact that it, the forgiveness had taken place in, in developing our sentence, and it really reduced the sentencing in those cases. So you, you're trying to compromise or find a compromise between traditions and and the Western the law. Western I mean, law. the Constitution and the statutes say, here is what you do when, there, when there, there's this particular kind of crime. And the customary way had been different and treating basically all these different except in the nuances of the particular settlement. And there was another really important area, Mark, and that was the area of customary punishments. There were situations where uh, people of the community and this had been done traditionally, uh, particularly in the state of Yap, we encountered this, uh, took the person that they believed and thought they knew had mm. done it, and they would take this person out and beat the person up in one way or the other, different ways yeah. and so on, depending on what young man's men were involved in the particular punishment. not be and. And we had to decide, what, what do we do with that? And uh, the state of Yap wanted us to let it go. The state of Yap had, had developed a policy of if there was a customary settlement, they were not going to prosecute uh, because that would offend the chiefs. And, and Yap's customary system is very strong to this day. Uh, and so that would have been a problem. But uh, the Yap Attorney General and I differed very much on that. And ultimately, he won. I mean, our, our criminal 
that's it's a much longer story than yeah. I've given, but that's that's a sweep, and then there are relationships between family members and so on when some kind of big conflict and they start hitting or chopping at each other and that kind of stuff. We had to we had to work on that, and uh, there were numerous instances of people. Uh, feeling there was some custom that allowed them to do something that under normal circumstances would not be acceptable. And uh, we had to wait our way through that, how we would treat those things. Well, uh, just to close up, what is the, is there any a connection between Hawaii and Federated States of Micronesia that you'd like to mention or talk about? Yeah, one, one important, uh, I mean, first, Hawaii and various Micronesian areas had the same missionaries. Okay. <laughs> All Congregationalists, they managed to get out that far too. And Koshai is deeply affected by that now. Uh, but because uh, the women sit in white on the floor, everybody sits on the floor, and the men, everybody's got suits, and, and the women have white dresses, and it's really a remarkable thing. It's a throwback to when the missionaries right. came. That has never changed there. Uh, but uh, I wanted to tell about, mention Mal Pialug, who was a very honored man, but he was a great navigator. Uh, of, a, of a lot of navigators that had traditionally been in Micronesia. Probably the Micronesians were perhaps the best navigators in the world, and I, I think they definitely were in, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, and uh, Pilu came when the Hawaiians were trying to develop and go their skills, redevelop their skills, and to go back to to uh, Tahiti, and uh, and the first time they went, they just they got all upset with each other, and and then just abandoned the effort about halfway through, and then uh, they were told about Pialug, uh, who was this honored statesman and seafarer still in Yap. And Pilug came and helped them and developed them into a good crew, and they did the work, and he also helped, brought his skills and taught them. And that led to? And Nainoa Thompson and, and the Hokalea, Hokalea and all that. He, they, actually, they were going in the Hokalea at, that, at those times. Um, so, but it, it and he was turned on, the he was Hawaiians the into seafarers. Yeah. Wow. He was the navigator on that, on that first successful flight, so but he was also the guy that held the group together, which mm -hmm. was important also. Yeah, and so we learned a lot from, from him and from somebody from what is now the Federated States of Micronesia. That's absolutely time. right. So maybe that's, that's what it's all about. Maybe I, that's I what think the there are lots saying. of reasons for people to cooperate yeah, over yeah. large distances and have an understanding of who each yeah. other are. Well, Ed, thank you very much for being my guest today. There was a lot we talked about, a lot more we can talk about, and hopefully we'll have you back again. We can talk about some more. All right. All right. Thank Get you. Get into much. that custom and tradition yeah. a little more next yeah. time. Yeah. Thank right. you very much. Thank Aloha. you. Aloha. Aloha.